Rebecca. Hi. Right. My name's Gabe Kuth. I played Orko, so I should probably just do it like this. <laughs> okay? Well, uh, hey, everybody. Are you having a good time? <laughs> oh, well, it's really great to be at a trolla. <laughs> this is my first time, except for the whole Eternia thing. <laughs> Thanks for coming, guys. Appreciate it. So we officially started here? Um, yeah, we can do that. I think uh, Gabe took over. No, no, I'm just wondering, is this when we drop the mic? You're like, I'm up. <laughs> <laughs> that was all we need. Let's, let's end on a good note. Just in case anyone doesn't know, obviously you're at the voice actors panel. So we'll go down the road and have everyone introduce themselves as if you don't already know who they are. But, you know, let's give them their time here. Uh, I'm John Callis. I'll be moderating for you. And I promise questions at the end. So, go ahead. Oh, we have to start with the... Uh, hmm? The man. The oh. man. <laughs> the man. <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> Alan Oppenheimer, glad to see you all. Thank you. My name is Brian Dobson, and I too played Skeletor. <laughs> My name is Gabe Kuth, and uh, I wanted to audition for Skeletor, um, and they went, nah, how about Orko? So I, yeah, okay. <laughs> and they said, well, you know what, hold on. What else can you do? I said, well, I could maybe sound like I'm five foot. 11 or something, and I went, well, you sound like you're five foot 10, but you can be Mechanic. So that's how I got that one. That's right. So I use that one with the ladies a lot at parties. <laughs> there is a market for this too, though. Hi, how are you? <laughs> well, I think uh, Gabe brings up an interesting uh, question that we can ask is, how did everyone get uh, involved in He-Man and she -Ra. What were your audition processes like? Did you audition for other characters that you might have wanted, didn't get, etc.? Mr. Oh, Oppenheimer. Yeah. Uh, one, one, one. Okay. Um, I auditioned for it. I went up to a Filmation. I'd never been there. And I met Lou Scheimer and uh, his partner, Norm Prescott. And I read for them. And uh, some people say, how did you come up with that voice? Well, it was because of his bony face, I made him nasal. So, uh, I figured there'd be a lot of mm, coming up into that bony cavity. <laughs> and uh, so that's how that came about. And the laugh, um, I don't like to play the stereotypical villain. I always like to find comedy in tragedy. So I just put that laugh in, and they bought it. And um, the insults were rather benign in the beginning. You boob and all of that. <laughs> so I had lived a lot of insults, which you never got to see or hear. <laughs> That's right, they're yeah. still on the cutting floor. <laughs> been auditioning for many things, commercials and all kinds of things like that. And so the first audition was done at the uh, agency. And then I heard I had a call back and I thought, well, that's strange, a call back for a, a, an animation series. Because back then, we didn't do callbacks necessarily. You just did the audition and then if you got it, you got it. So they sent me over to Filmation into Lou's office. Lou is a wonderful man, was a wonderful man, by the way. He made you feel very comfortable. And we started discussing this character. And I realized, oh, this isn't just a character. This is 
this is something very special. So uh, we talked about her, and uh, then I guess I found out I got the role. And then after that, it was even more uh, expansive. I was sent to Mattel to look at the doll, and then I was uh, uh, just kind of awed by the process, because it was very different from just an ordinary cartoon. And that's how I got the job, just basically auditioning for it. How long was it uh, for you to uh, hear about getting the part? Did you have to wait I for a long time? Remember. I don't remember. And, but, and did you put much... Part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Did you put much on um, this character, or were you like, oh, whatever, it's just another character? Another part, no, another part I mean, I did it first. In the first audition, I thought, well, this is fun. But then after I spoke with Lou, who was so passionate about making this character his vision, and uh, when I realized that, of course, that brings you into someone else's heart, and you, oh, okay, and you cover, oh, this is important. So um, that's basically how it was. I'm also, I'm just, I'm just really curious here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With, the, with the character, did you um, also feel like, okay, she has to be strong, but there's got to be like this feminine oh, quality, but there's got to well, be this strength. Well, you just take a look at her and she's yeah. pretty feminine. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> But, but because, because she started out as Adora and then turned into She-Ra, in my brain, I had been trained in the classics, and so she was more of a Juliet type of innocent thing. And then when she turns into She-Ra, she turns into the woman. And, and that's kind of how my brain approached it, my actor brain approached it. Well, I really like your work. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you're, when, you know, when you're 12 years old, you know, it's, it's an important time. <laughs> the whole woman transition thing was happening to me, but, you know, different. <laughs> um, my process, it was, it was kind of interesting because uh, all of a sudden things have changed over. Mattel was in charge of the project, and uh, it, it was a four callback audition. <laughs> there was four callbacks on this to get there. And then finally it was meeting with the team with Mattel, uh, Ian Richter, Gary Hartle, Dean Stefan. And they were very adamant about keeping this essence of, of, uh, of what Alan had done. And uh, I received many voice prints of what you had done uh, leading up into that, just saying that we really want to, we want to keep this, you know, we want to keep this continuity of the character. Um, but we don't want to make it identical, obviously, because it'd be a new series, so we want to kind of keep that continuity of what we have, but put a bit more of your own signature onto it. So we kind of played the sandbox for a while and came up with some different variations until we kind of locked in with it. And uh, um, I think on the callback that won me in the end was they, they liked my cackle. So that was, uh, <laughs> that, that was very helpful. And thank you, Alan, for, for bringing that down the pipe. It was <laughs> talk about coattail riding. <laughs> but it was it was an amazing experience, and then uh, I I think I played about eight eight characters on that series, so it was a lot of fun. I'll be so upset if they ever choose another Shira. I really will be upset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't need to. Oh. <laughs> Game. But isn't that always the case? I don't know if you, it's the same experience with you guys, but I always find with uh, direction and animation, they're always telling, they're always giving you mixed messages, you know? It's like, you sound like Alan, but don't, uh, you know? Or it's like, okay, this character has an, uh, a British accent. Say, so, eh, right, he's just got a British accent. No, pull it back. Okay, so he's just got a little bit of a British accent. Perfect. <laughs> You're like, but, but more British. It's like this dog chasing its tail. That's how I find it. You know? So when you're saying you're getting ribbed about, you know, well, we want to keep it like the classic, but we also want to reinvent it. But, you know, it's, yeah, it, what it do you do with that? You know? A spark sometimes will shoot out of your ear at one point. It's just like, well, I don't know what to do with that. You know, it's, but um, I'm glad it worked out. Well, I think that was for, for my case. I um, auditioned for Orco, and yeah, it was, it was in Vancouver. Same process as Brian. Um, yeah, but we, you know, uh, we auditioned separately or whatever, but uh, I think I had a couple of callbacks. But it was the same thing. I think with Orko, if I'm not mistaken, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the, the original voice uh, had some sort of effect to it, like it was sped up. 
or something. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, I was just getting a lot of ribbing by going, talk faster, talk faster, talk faster, you know? And they didn't really, but because I was 12 years old and I watched the show, uh, my first memory of He-Man was when I was 12 years old and I was going, wow, that's like Star Wars and Conan together. That is like so cool, you know? Um, so I, I wanted to honor that character, but again, it's like, we want you to sound like a sped up voice. But we, we're not going to speed your voice up. You're just going to have to talk really fast. But you have to sound exactly like the original. I mean, kind of impossible. So I, I just did what I uh, thought I could do. And I didn't hold a spoon to anybody's head. And I got the job. You know what I'm saying? And then Mechanek was weird. It was just like, um, it's like they didn't think about it as much, unfortunately. I mean, I think with Mechanek's lament, we all kind of found out how much they were really thinking about this character. An episode about how much you suck. Now, enjoy that. <laughs> 22 minutes of you sucking. Um, but, but that one was actually, we were recording a session. They just said, um, we gotta do, someone's gotta play mech and neck. And we actually went around, the, it was, I think it was an, okay, one of those, it was one of those awkward auditions where everyone's in the room now. And it's like, now your turn. Oh, you know, terrible. your turn. <laughs> Well, we've it after it's having to walk the Hall of Shame because you know, the, the recording room's down the hall and there's the hallway that goes to where the green room is, where everyone's waiting. And we know everyone that's getting shuffled into the green room has just walked the Hall of Shame. <laughs> <laughs> and it, well, yeah, it was, uh, I never really liked that audition process as to where they're like, okay, who can do this, you know? And they, they, they would get thrown into the circle and then, uh, well, you won, didn't you, Gabe? Well, I, I won simply because they were really going, that's like, you know, you would you'd do it and they'd go, that is amazing, but Brian, you're already playing, like, oh, let's have a look. Well, you're, apparently you, you're playing 12 characters already. Okay, um, what about Brian Drummond? Well, you're playing 10 characters. Gabe, who are you playing? Arco? No. You know what, you've got the part of Mechanic. Like, let's just, can we record this? And we want him to sound British, but not British. You know what we mean. Or they, oh, they'll throw the you know, British mid-Atlantic thing is what they're looking for. And it's just like, you, you give it to him, it's like, oh, it's too British, too, too British. It's like, it's, it sounds good, but you gotta remember, his, his neck is long, so they can just kind of, uh, give us some sort of, uh, you know, something, something like that, you know. Just think long neck, just keep thinking about it. Reconnaissance. Okay, you got it? All right. So outside of your main character voices that you all just talked about, you also voiced a lot of secondary characters uh, in the cartoons. What was your process in developing the voices for those characters, and how do you keep all of the different voices uh, straight in your head when you have to record so many lines uh, per episode? Well, um, I, 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 as I, as I started with Skeletor, and then they said, can you do Merman? I said, well, what is that? Well, he's in the water. I said, well, of course I can do that. I have sure for that. <laughs> and then they said, well, now, <laughs> well we, uh, we also have this, uh, this, uh, this uh, cow uh, cowardly, uh, uh, what was it, tiger. <laughs> we know a lot of children like that, don't we? <laughs> and. And then, um, what was the other one I did? Oh, well, Man at Arms is just, that's just me, you know, straight. Well, I called it straight anyway. <laughs> but uh, somebody said uh, to me, um, this is a common question, uh, do, you, uh, do you do all the characters and then go back and do them again? I said, no. I, it was my choice to talk to myself. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, if I recorded all of Skeletor and then went back and did all of Merman, they'd have to play the lead in line for me to know how to answer it in turn. So I said, I'll just do, I'll just flip from one to the other. So I did. So if it's Skeletor and Merman and Cringer in a conversation, it's... <laughs> Merman! Oh, shut up! <laughs> They want to take two, they got to start at the beginning. <laughs> 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 Hopefully 
for me, uh, there were the two main characters were, of course, Adora and She-Ra. And I think I've mentioned before about how Adora would start out very innocent and then turn into She-Ra. And then there were other characters like Ketra, <laughs> whom I just loved because she had such an ineffectual... Please uh, don't do that when I'm saying that. <laughs> Dead. <laughs> <laughs> I love him. <laughs> but anyway, so there was Catra, and then the, some of the villains were just hysterical because they they would throw them at me really fast, and I'd get, oh, what am I going to do with this? And I'd go, oh, no, like, I'm going to harp it, I just can't understand. All of those characters were just were, were, were in my head, but they had to come out and not be like any other thing I'd ever done or tried to not do. So sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And I do remember one, one very sad little thing to my mind. With Castispella, I had just watched a Katherine Hepburn movie. <laughs> so she kind of came out like this. <laughs> Actresses, and I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> no, but, but that's kind of how it, it worked. And then, of course, we see the pictures, and and uh, and Scorpio was just mean, and so she had a kind of mean voice. But uh, that's how it worked for me. And just sometimes people have voices in their heads, and they have a place to come out, and that's what happens. You're learning more about voice actors all the time. Yeah. <laughs> It's the voices that keep talking. Uh, it was, it was uh, I think He-Man was actually one of the series that I, I, I well, definitely the more characters that I ever had. It was, it was uh, interesting because I mean, uh, with King Hiss, it was pretty obvious they wanted something that had something uh, very slithery and something to us. It was great. King Hiss, now kneel before your new master. You know, just getting the S's and stuff with it. With squeeze, yeah, they, they wanted something very throaty, so we had that, uh, I, I kind of almost went with the Dr. Claw thing, where, mm, you deepened evil. And just kind of, yeah, it was... <laughs> but, a lot of them were very descriptive, and, and uh, Gary and Dean Stefan and, and, and the guys were very helpful with trying to kind of find what, and, you know, they were very descriptive with what they wanted, so... It was, uh, yeah, reaching to that library of voices in the head and just putting a place to them, you know, but uh, buzz off. Uh, they wanted that very clean and dreamed voice, you know, the voice of reason and very clear and precise. Uh, so it, it, was, it was very easy to find the characters with them because, I mean, they were so character-y, you know. Uh, it was a pleasure. One thing that's sort of interesting was um, I wanted to audition for Merman. When that came up, that's when I was going, yeah, we're going to do that table audition session again, right? No. They're just like, <laughs> Scott McNeil. And I was like, how did that, how, how did we just agree that Scott McNeil's doing Merman? Because I, I always thought that Merman was so amazing, like that vocalist. So I was just like, you know, like at home, like just trying to practice that whole thing. <laughs> uh, but I didn't, get the, I didn't get the part Scott McNeil did. Um, but the funny thing was, is I, I took a page from you and uh, I did my version of you in another a Canadian cartoon, Doctor of Dimension Pants. I played oh, Underwater Man. Yes. It was like, Underwater Man! <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that might be an interesting question. Is, um, was there ever a character that you guys wanted to play, but you didn't end up being cast uh, in, in that? I'm sorry. It, was, was there ever a, a, a cartoon character that you wanted to play, but you didn't actually end up playing? Oh, probably everything that Mel Blanc did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long list, eh? He really had them all, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Between Mel Blanc and Frank Welker, there's oh. not much left. <laughs> <laughs> But I guess Orko and Mechanic was fairly simple. Just the two, and uh, they're just such an antithesis, you know. One guy's, as we've established, five foot ten and a half, and the other guy's this big. So it was uh, kind of simple. 
Um, so we want to go ahead and open it up to the audience questions. So if you have a question, if you can line up at the microphone, uh, and, and just let us have it, you know what I mean? We, just, we want honesty here. I understand there are a lot of purists out there, but that's all good. Good day. Um, I'm very interested. Uh, you mentioned in terms of uh, Orko, the original Orko, having a treatment on his voice, and I understand when John Irwin did He Man, they put some sort of reverb on him. So I'm curious uh, what any other experiences any of you had with your voices being treated for certain characters, um, and in particular, I was interested with. Um, Brian's differentiation between Keldor and Skeletor, because I found it funny that he was more nasal when he didn't have a nose than when he <laughs> actually had a nose. It's funny you said that because I was saying the same thing in the audition, well, just kind of finding that character, and they really were just like, no, oh, he's got to be very nasal. And I was like, well, wouldn't he be more, you know, as the Skeletor? Pro? Should we give him a little more depth if they wanted to go that direction with him? And, uh, and that's what we did, but. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting when, they, when it comes to voice treating and, and whatnot, because uh, most of the time I tell you, but I've had some times where uh, production has come out in the end and also I'm like, oh, <laughs> they, they pitched my voice. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you know about, sometimes they don't tell you, you know, it, it, it's a mixed bag of nuts. Well, you, you, sometimes you don't want to go down that road, especially like with Mechanic, you know, because then you start overthinking it, because they, they put some kind of like, uh, something, some sort of effect on it to make it sound like he was talking through a microphone or something all the time. But you're going, but wait a minute, man. Like his neck is metal, but he's got like his, his mouth, like he's got good dental. So <laughs> like, why would he have it? So you don't want to go down that road. You're going, but maybe his like larynx is metal and stuff. I don't know. Oh my God, this is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> did, uh, did you have any I've never had, uh, uh, no, I've never, it's never, whatever voices I did, they never. Why didn't you want to treat this voice? Oh, poof. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't had the experience yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, Alan Skeletor might not have ever had uh, much success against He Man, but he's a very good Honda salesman. Very good what? Oh, no. <laughs> remember that? I remember it. I didn't do it. I thought it was terrible. <laughs> I love you. I love you. I'll bet you they didn't sell one car after that. <laughs> Does anyone know who did voice that character? Does anyone know the actress? Is he in the room? <laughs> there he is! Get him! <laughs> um, you both did a, a, both Skeletor and a little, I think it was a playful little, just a, a video on the internet to help, sort of help promote uh, m the Masters of the Universe um, subscription, right? So I was, yeah. I was just wondering how that came about and uh, did you have fun doing that? And I really agree, thank, you know, thanks for supporting the line and keeping it going, helping, helping it keep it going uh, it, for all it was an honor. It was an honor to be able to help with that. Anything towards the sale and, and the forwarding of this series, I think, is a wonderful thing. And uh, Pixel Dan over here. Uh, and Danielle. We gotta get and Danielle, Danielle yeah, who is the mastermind behind uh, uh, the whole commercial thing that we put together. And uh, Alan and I, we sat out the back there in the sun and uh, we just kind of ad-libbed our way through this little battle with the... Uh, oh, yeah action figures, it uh, took multiple takes, and then we had that, um, what was her name that did the uh, Skeletor? Oh yeah, uh, like Constantine, she's in there. Constantine, right? yeah, yeah, she's yeah. here this, yeah. this year as well, which is great to see here, but uh, it was it was just funny, I mean, we were playing with her toys, for those of you who haven't seen it, where Alan and I are kind of battling with her Skeletors, and all sorts of, <laughs> this very attractive, you know, Skeletor comes by, and all of a sudden she's <laughs> <laughs> we kind of drop the dolls and it's just kind of like we're a little bit dumbfounded by the experience. <laughs> it's, just, uh, it's pretty cute. <laughs> um, how did you get to be voice actors? Uh -huh. oh. How do you, you get, get to be a voice actor? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Stay in school. <laughs> how old are you? Uh, seven. Seven, that's not too early. <laughs> I started imitating people that I heard on the radio when I was your age. 
So I had a pretty good ear all of when I was seven or eight years old. And I would imitate, uh, there was no television then, there was, uh, you know, two tin cans and a radio. <laughs> and I would imitate people that I heard and I found that I had an ear and I just developed it over a long period of time. And then actually, I started in radio when I was about 14, 15 or something, and then really got involved when I was about 18 in college in, in Pittsburgh. It's just, a, it's progress, it's just beginning. So you want to do it, just start doing, copying other people, and then you'll bend it and make it your own. In other words, if you wanted to do a Skeletor, if you wanted to do a She-Ra, let's say a She-Ra, you'd start by copying her, and then you'd twist it a little bit for your personality, and then you've created a character. Get it? Okay. <laughs> Perfect answer, Alan. That was a very good answer, yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, there's so many ways to get in with voiceover. I mean, sometimes uh, when you would get into the professional end of things, it, uh, it does help where you live. I mean, for those of you living in Los Angeles, this is a wonderful town to, to get involved with voiceover, obviously. Uh, where Gabe and I live in Vancouver, Canada. Not bad. Not bad. It's a good town for, I mean, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's you know, it, it, it helps being in areas where there's a lot of animation and stuff going over, well, obviously, if that's what you want to get into. But it, as Alan said, it's, it's uh, a good thing to do is, you know, watch a lot of that Saturday morning cartoon stuff, learn these voices, and then put your own twist on some of these voices, get a demo together, and, uh, you know, start shopping uh, uh, an agent eventually. There's, there's, there's such a process that it would take far too long for this panel to really explain <laughs> getting it properly, but uh, I think that was a great analogy. Too, almost. Mm -hmm. It changes so fast. Too. It really does. The industry over the last few years has changed immensely, but uh, I do find that th these days they're thirsting for a lot of new talent, so oh, I, yeah. I would recommend people going towards voice because a lot of us of the older school have uh, been doing it a lot and a lot of the clients want to hear some new stuff, so yeah, it's a good time. Well, I'd say like My Little Pony is probably uh, the majority of the cast are probably actors your age. Hi. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of kids your age that are actually uh, voice actors professionally, saving their money for university, yeah. uh, and then they get into brain surgery or <laughs> civil engineering. Okay. I worked on a, 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 another series called Avatar, uh, Air, Air, you know, Airbender, and the kids in that were close. To, yeah, they were they were uh, um, a li just a little bit older than you, so it's not too late to seriously start thinking about it. I, I wish I'd known actually earlier at a younger age because I, I in, uh, to these days I mean, sometimes I'm working with these young children that are making very good money. <laughs> They're doing <laughs> more so like, oh, darn it, you know, I wish I could have gone in sooner. But, uh, yeah, start now. Mm -hmm. quite Absolutely. A, quite a few of our colleagues, actually, their kids are now, you know, working more than us. <laughs> you know, but, uh, at least you know to go where to borrow five bucks, you know what I'm saying? Um, and another thing I would say, young lady, is that I would uh, get into reading and I would get into listening to your parents and your friends. <laughs> uh, no, but you know, listening is really key because my daughter, she's nine and she wants to get into it as well. Uh, but she has a tendency to be shy. Like she's great in the bedroom doing her thing, but when she's in front of people, and, and then you're gonna feel like a goldfish because there's this glass wall and then all these producers and everyone wants you to sound British or not British or whatever, and hit, hit this word here or not hit that word there. I mean, it's a lot to take in, so you gotta know how to read well, you need to uh, listen to direction. Um, I mean, I know for myself, I just, I just wanna do what they wanna do. I'm not, I'm not going in there going, it's, no, it's, I'm the artist, I'm just gonna do my own thing. I'm just like, whatever. It's your, it's your project, it's your property. How do I say it again? So, listen and read would be a great one. <laughs> Uh, if I may interject something here, you're well on the way. You had enough courage to step up to the microphone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Impressive. All right, well, unfortunately, our time is up. Oh, oh. No. 
But I think we would have enough time for everyone to maybe share a fun anecdote or something from when they were recording an episode or their time at Filmation or Mike Young to kind of make us feel like we were in the recording session with you. Uh, thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Your voice. Oh. Oh, gosh. All right. Okay. You a voice? Is sure, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, well, um, let's see. We'll just do the... I am Adora, He-Man's twin sister and defender of the Crystal Castle. Fabulous secrets were revealed to me the day I held aloft my sword and said, For the honor of Grayskull, I am She-Ra! <laughs> Just like yesterday. I am the lecherous Skeletor. <laughs> well, it's been great fun being with you all, and I'm sorry I don't ad lib very well, although I could go on forever and draw. This room would be empty. Anyway, thank you. You've been wonderful, and I look forward to seeing you all outside there. Thank you all for joining us to see this spectacular display of voices. <laughs> Afterwards, I'll find Trapjaw, my metallurgical miscreant, and get him to get that ambrosia, and eventually will take over Eternia once and for all. <laughs> Also, what did you say? I see that a lot of you people have these devices for reconnaissance, and I think that's pretty cool. Maybe we could talk shop later on. Anyway, enjoy the convention. And uh, I hope there's some trauma pudding. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Let's give one more big round of applause.